Okay. So thank you for the exceedingly flattering introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't attend the conference in person this year, but hopefully I will get to meet all of you next year. Um, so first, a slight correction. I had a slight misunderstanding. I'm mostly not going to talk about data and calibration, despite what the email announcement said. Uh, that stuff's boring anyway. So instead, I'm going to talk a bit about my experiences doing um, really primarily quantitative, but really any kind of system dynamics work and a couple of things that I've learned in the process. So I am a public health modeler, uh, but my path to this point has been somewhat roundabout. Um, like many of us, I think, I first encountered system dynamics somewhat by accident. Um, it was some years before I started my PhD, and it was a revelation. I think most of us in this field share this experience where, you know, when we first encounter this, this systems perspective, it just makes sense of so many things that we see in the world. It's really eye-opening, and we go, you know, this this is the way, right? So I had that experience. I joined the system, the system dynamics group at MIT and worked on several topics, uh, environmental issues, organizational issues. Uh, and then a couple of years into my PhD, uh, this project came up where the US Food and Drug Administration wanted a systems model of the opioid crisis. And they wanted to, quote, commission a panel of experts to build this model. So I assume what they had in mind was something like this, but somehow they ended up with me. So despite that, you know, I'm sure they were disappointed, but I helped them build the model anyway, and that turned into my dissertation, and they adopted this model, we published a few papers about it, and now I'm here. So what have I learned from all this? What is the number one secret of system dynamics, which I am going to share with you today? Well, the most important thing in system dynamics is to do good work. That's it. Thanks. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not about doing good work. That is the number one secret of system dynamics. But let's talk a bit more about what it means to do good work. So first, why is it important that we do good work? Obviously, you know, in general, it's true you want to do 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 good work. But I think it's especially true for us in system dynamics um, because all of us are here. I think because we give a damn, right? We care about some problem, some issue, some community. And we're also here because we think that a systems perspective, a systems approach can help to improve things because this is the way, right? So the first order reason to do good work is because we want to improve something about the world. But there's also a second order reason, which is that we want more people to adopt this approach, this systems perspective or approach that we think can really make things better. And to encourage that sort of growth or expansion of the reach of system dynamics, that also requires us to do good work in a slightly different um, but nonetheless complementary way. So that's the why. What about the how? Well, I'm sure all of you know the George Box quote, all models are useful. Uh, sorry, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I want to add uh, that there are also, however, plenty of models that are not useful and some models that are more wrong than others. So to do good work, we want to make sure that our models are more useful and less wrong. So what does that mean? Well, within the system dynamics community, there are some pretty well established, pretty well thought out standards for doing that, um, various sorts of best practices and so on. I'm not here to talk about those. There's plenty of resources that you can read, right? What I want to add to that though, is that for us, especially as students, we spend a lot of time uh, and energy, we focus a lot on learning these standards and these practices. And there's good reason for that. It is absolutely crucial, don't get me wrong, it's crucial to learn them and learn them well. But doing good work, um, well, to, to do good work, meeting these standards is necessary but insufficient. You need to go beyond them. Because doing good work, I think, means engaging with external audiences. So I'm going to pick on Celia for a moment. When, when she uh, gave me the brief for this talk. She said, I should talk about what's needed in a system dynamics focused dissertation. But unless you are a methodologist, which methodology work is very important, but it's quite rare. Unless you're a methodologist, there's no such thing as a system dynamics focused dissertation. Your dissertation could be using system dynamics. It could be about a system dynamics model, but it is focused on the problem or the issue that you're modeling. And again, unless you're a methodologist, your main audience for your work should not be here. It should not be people at this conference or within this community. Instead, you need to be aiming to engage with others outside of it, whether that's 
policy actors, clients, other domain specific researchers, or you know the broader discourse that we call the literature. Because if you do that, you are going to get a higher quality model and it's also going to make sure that your model doesn't end up being useless because if you just build a model in isolation and nobody ever looks at it, it is not going to be useful. If you want your model to actually influence action or influence ideas, you need to engage. Um, so that's what we did when we were working with FDA, for instance. I worked in-house with them for three years. I was a research fellow there. I briefed leadership, joined policy discussions and so on. And that's how you make sure that work is actually taken up in a decision process. But of course, that was a somewhat exceptional circumstance because they were actively seeking a systems model. And so we were lucky in that way, right? Most of the time, we are not going to be so lucky because unfortunately, system dynamics is simply not that well known in the world. And most people in most fields, they have established ways of doing things. And we are trying to break into that. And implicitly, what we're saying by trying to break into that is, you know, our perspective, this systems approach can contribute something more that they, uh, within their own field, um, are unable to see. And this is a tough sell, right? We are proselytizing as outsiders. We're saying, hey, we've got this great thing, systems. And that's a tough sell. So how do we do that? Well, 20 years ago, Nelson Repenning in his, uh, it was actually his Forster Award address, had this great paper selling system dynamics to other social scientists. And the thing is, I think the real trick is we don't sell it. We shouldn't try to sell it at least because nobody's going to be buying it. People from other fields don't want to hear about system dynamics. They don't care about it. And to be fair to Nelson, that's kind of the conclusion that he comes to as well. Instead of trying to sell system dynamics, what we need to be doing is learning to speak the languages and meet the standards of whatever fields that we're engaging with, whether that's economics, epidemiology, operations, whatever. And I think that that's that it's actually possible to do that because fundamentally, you know, we tend to get caught up in how different it is, the, the, this thing that we do. Um, but fundamentally, our models and our methods are not actually that different um, from what's found in other fields. In business dynamics, there's this table where uh, it highlights, you know, terms used in different disciplines to refer to stocks and flows. But it's not just stocks and flows. Actually, most of what we do in our models can be translated in a similar way, right? We can talk about, you know, grounded theory as a way of as, of explaining how we develop qualitative models. We can talk about mechanistic modeling to explain what causal links are, right? The idea here is, if you're in trying to, if you're trying to engage with domain-specific, domain-relevant discourse, we can frame most of what we do in terms that are already familiar to people in other fields, because there is a, there is actually a lot of overlap on the technical side of what we do. So, for instance, again, with our periods model, when I started with the FTA, they already had this basic idea. They wanted a population-level compartment model of people moving through different states of opioid use, right? And so. Over the course of the project, we added a lot of detail, but we didn't change the fundamental structure or the fundamental modality of the model because it was something that they were already familiar with, already comfortable with. And instead, the main thing we added was feedback. And we said, okay, you've got these populations, you've got them transitioning at certain hazard rates. Let's make those hazard rates dynamic. Let's make them time varying and driven by feedback processes. So in technical terms, that's a pretty... I mean, it's not a small change, but it's not a huge change. It's not a very major change to have time varying hazard rates, but the implications of that are quite big. The broader point is what differentiates system dynamics model from a technical perspective from most other simulation models, it's not really that much. The bigger differences in what we do are philosophical. Uh, I think system dynamics models are characterized by a few things. There's broad model boundaries, endogenous feedback, um, time dynamics, uh, temporal dynamics, and also where there are decision processes involved, we have behaviorally, sorry, behaviorally realistic decision rules. And we use this language of stocks and flows and causal loop diagrams, and the syntax that we have is very useful for capturing this philosophical essence and this perspective. And we spend a lot of time and effort learning it, especially as students. But it is not actually essential to what makes something a system dynamics model. So because this syntax, these, the, the, these differences in how we present things, they can often be a barrier to understanding and a barrier to acceptance, um, but they're actually 
really kind of the least important thing that we do, the least important part of what we're bringing to the table here. The difference in, philo in philosophical perspective and the difference in outcomes that we get as a result, these are much more important, right? And most researchers, most people from other fields, from other backgrounds, they tend to be pretty skeptical people. And so the differences in presentation can be a barrier to their acceptance. And so instead of getting hung up on that, we need to learn to frame our work uh, in ways that come across as very, very normal, right? It needs to be able to pass other people's smell tests. It needs to have face validity. And then what you do is you, you sneak in these minor tweaks, these minor changes that seem like relatively minor things, like adding a bit of feedback, but the result is that you get some very different insights in the end. So for the same reason, it's important to also um, make sure that you're doing rigorous work, rigorous not just by the standards of system dynamics modeling, uh, but by the standards of the fields that we're engaging with. Because again, the point here is we're trying to convince other people that our work is meeting the requirements that they expect from their field, that it's valid by their standards, right? Every field has some sort of technical standards. Um, you know, my, my, my work's primarily quantitative. Um, so the examples I'm gonna talk about are quantitative standards, but there are technical standards in qualitative work as well. And so if other people are going to look at your work and they see that, okay, you've checked all the boxes for what they think of as good work, as rigorous work, they're more likely to trust it. and when you start talking about things that they don't necessarily fully understand what they do or, sorry what you're doing um, they're more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt then so this is where i'm actually going to talk very briefly about model calibration um, i'm going to get give you just a couple of examples from my own work um, first off i don't actually like to talk about model calibration because even though the term model calibration is common in system dynamics and some engineering fields. I prefer to talk about model estimation or parameter estimation because people from most modeling disciplines care about parameter estimation more because this puts the emphasis on identifying um, the correct model parameters rather than generating the correct model behavior, which again, as system dynamicists, we may disagree with, but that's what people expect. So again, we're doing this slight like linguistic shift, right? Um, rigorous model estimation is actually a really good way to demonstrate to others that you're doing serious work, especially because in the last 10 to 20 years, I think there've been a lot of methodological advances here. Um, there's especially in, um, in terms of Bayesian approaches to model estimation and system dynamics models, uh, they actually mesh quite well with Bayesian approaches, but even if you're not going full on Bayesian, um, there's really no excuse nowadays uh, not to do some sort of likelihood-based MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, to try to estimate parameters, to quantify uncertainty, and so on. I think that's preferable to basic optimization, where you just get point estimates, and it is definitely better than the sort of old-school system dynamics way of doing things, which is just eyeball it, right? We also did, uh, in our work, a lot of validation. So we had multiple validation approaches, um, and I'm sure Yaman will talk more about validation shortly. Uh, among other things, we did synthetic data analysis to try to, to quantify uh, credible interval coverage. We did so out-of-sample validation to check prediction accuracy. Now, out-of-sample validation is interesting because it's very standard in a lot of mechanistic and statistical modeling fields. And in we... Within the system dynamics community, I think we tend to be a bit skeptical of it for good reason, uh, but it's what people expect to see. And so we did it anyway to help build trust in the model. We also did a lot of sensitivity analysis. There's parametric sensitivity, structural sensitivity analyses, and so on. And this is actually an area where I think system dynamics system dynamic standards tend to be a bit higher than uh, the standards in a lot of other modeling disciplines. So we tried to meet that level as well. And I hope this, this helps to show how we are trying to meet both um, our own internal standards as system dynamics modelers, as well as external standards, what other people might expect to see. And then finally, we made everything as transparent as possible. So uh, we had a fully documented model. Actually, the paper for the model was about seven to eight pages. The documentation in the supplement was about 90 pages um, because we tried to explain every decision that went into the structure and the data and how we handled all of that 
um, in as much detail as possible. And we made all of that, the, the analytical pipeline, the code, the documentation, data, everything uh, publicly available online, uh, because that's the expectation nowadays, right? For modern data sharing, modern re re reproducibility standards. Yeah, there are all these standard tools that people expect you to use, and so we made sure to use them. Again, the idea is not just to make sure that you are doing good work um, for, for yourself, but also to show people that this is a good model, not just by the standards of a system dynamics model, but by the standards of any model, because that's how that's one way that people will judge your work and learn to trust its quality. Because it's only when people actually trust your work that they become receptive to what I think is the real value of a systems perspective. Because a lot of the insights that we are going to bring by virtue of the systems perspective are quite counterintuitive, right? And it takes some degree, some significant degree of trust before people are going to be receptive to these counterintuitive insights. And I find it useful um, to borrow a concept from advocacy and organizing work, which is the ladder of engagement concept. So the, the point of the ladder of engagement is different people are at different points in the ladder. They have different levels of familiarity with system dynamics. And you need to be constantly moving people up the ladder, but at the same time, you need to meet people where they're at to start with. So most of you, most of you in this audience, by virtue of the fact that you're here, you're already somewhere up here, right? And you're continuing to move up the ladder. But we tend to focus a lot on ourselves. We focus on these upper levels. And it's easy to forget that most people we engage with, most external audiences, policy people, researchers from other fields and so on, they're going to be somewhere down here. And they don't necessarily know um, what we're doing. They don't know why they should care. They don't know why they should trust us. And so that's why we need to first demonstrate uh, both the rigor of what we're doing and the value that we can bring before we start to really hit them with you know, all of the, the complications of what a systems approach really means. And that's how we, we kind of move them up from the lower levels on that ladder. And that I think that's something that's really important to learn to do sooner rather than later. So that brings me back to the original, really the only point of this whole talk, which is we need to be always doing good work. Now I want to just, as my final point, um, I know this is hard, especially for students where, you know, you're already trying to learn and try to, trying to master um, system dynamics techniques. And here I am telling you at the same time, you need to be learning and mastering the language and the standards and the methods of other domains as well. And that's a lot of work. It's dancing backwards in high heels and you have to be prepared for that. But, you know, I know being a grad student is hard enough as it is. And so I say this with compassion and with understanding, but that's just the nature of the challenge. Doing better work is never easy. If it was easy, it would have been done already. So let's get to work. Awesome. Thanks so much to you guys. So if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand um, and I will do my best to moderate and or call on folks. Nashon, Nashon, if that's correct. Uh, thank you. This is Nashon Adero from Kenya. And I would like to ask the professor to expound more on uh, sensitivity analysis, uh, the dichotomy between uh, parametric sensitivity and uh, structural sensitivity. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm not a professor, but I'm happy to talk about sensitivity analysis. So, sensitivity analysis basically, you know, because I mean, the, the take a step back. Uh, basic idea is all models are wrong, and we can never uh, fully know all of the ways in which they're wrong. But the idea is okay. Um, does it matter if it if the model is wrong in any particular way? And so we the difference for parametric versus structural sensitivity is you know in parametric sensitivity you say what if the parameter values that we have, whether they, they are estimated based on data or whether we made assumptions about them, what if those parameters are wrong? 
So you vary those parameters in your model and you see if the behavior of the model changes in any way that really matters for the outcomes that you care about. And structural sensitivity is the same thing, but you instead of, um, of varying parameter values, you vary the, the, the actual structure of the model. So this is something that is, I think, not very often done in most other modeling fields. Um, it is not always done with system dynamics models, but it should be. Uh, with system dynamics models, when you're talking about modifying the structure, usually it's do you, if you change either the, the stock and flow structure or if you change the feedback structure. So one of the, the, the main, the best ways to do it, I think, for a system dynamics model is if you do sort of loop knockout. So if you deactivate some of the feedbacks and you see what changes um, in terms of model behavior and outcomes that you care about. Hopefully that answers the question. Martha, go ahead. Thank you. And for a, a wonderful presentation, uh, T.S. Uh, uh, one of the um, enormous, and, and I think very, very difficult to tap in, in, an, in an industrialized society, uh, benefit to, the, uh, to sharing the systems thinking and system dynamics methodologies and practices uh, or examples, I should say, domain-based uh, pra practices, is uh, to somehow, I think, start highlighting the um, uh, the capacity of the uh, really infinite uh, transferability, the, uh, the 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 general sort of system thinking uh, symbolic uh, language, if you will, uh, to people in the don to people in domains, since everyone is in a domain, who who are our clients, who who in the field uh, of, of uh, system thinking and system dynamics do you envision is is able to do this enormous uh, quantum leap in thinking uh, in do in the domains that they have access to a highly highly infinitely really transferable uh, means of thinking that can enhance their 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 own pro continued problem solving once you walk out the door uh, as a system dynamics trained individual and somehow plant a seed in their minds that you have these capacities to to be a generalist thinker in in, in a world which is highly highly hyper specialized uh who who is who who how is this how is this benefit uh, going to start to gain some traction? Yeah. Okay. I think I get what you're saying. Um, the, to to the direct question of who, I think the answer is all of us, um, because essentially yeah. that that's kind of what I'm trying to get at here is most people are I mean, because to to really sort of unlock this 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 uh, the the potential of this more generalist perspective this more generalist thinking that you're talking about um it takes a fair amount of work right it is a substantial amount of effort and most people are not going to put in that sort of effort if they don't see some sort of benefit or some sort of reason to do that and so that's why i i personally think the important thing when we are out there engaging with others in whatever domain they're in the important thing is to first get them to trust you enough to listen to you and then get them to realize that what you're saying actually has important implications even kind of by where you know you can adhere to their own standards and do work that they can trust and yet somehow see and yield these different results that are different in ways that are meaningful right and once they start to realize that hang on you know taking this this systems perspective does make a difference and in, in in some sort of important way, then that provides at least a little motivation for them to then try to incorporate that a bit more and hopefully then to make the effort to, to try to push through to this more, more abstract and more generalizable way of thinking, if that makes sense. So that's why I think the, the first step is build trust. Second step is demonstrate value. And only after that, then we can start to talk about getting people to learn these ways of thinking. 